step back and look and see if you're feeling really deep down, if you've lost a lot, believe it or not, you want to focus on what's going right because you've got to get your own self-confidence and morale up again. And so you've got to see what are the things I'm doing that are making me very successful, then go and look and say, okay, let's look at some of these that I've lost. And did I do those things that make me successful? Or did I forget them? Or did something else happen? And I didn't have to do those things in the ones that made me successful. This is Outside Sales Talk, the best podcast for outside salespeople. I'm your host, Steve Benson, and we're here to chat with the world's top sales experts so that you can get their best sales tactics to level up your game. Welcome back to Outside Sales Talk. Today, we've got Kendra Lee with us, and we're talking about restoring your win rate. By way of introduction, um, Kendra is a lead generation and strategy expert. She's a speaker, she's authored several books, and she's also a business owner. After starting her sales career with IBM, which is also where I started my sales career uh, by chance, Kendra founded the KLA Group on the philosophy that sales is not an art, but a learned skill, something I could not agree with more. Well, welcome to the show, Kendra. Well, thank you for having me, Steve. It's a pleasure to be here. So let's get started. Uh, First, what role would you say discipline plays in the sales process? Yeah, here I just said sales is not an art. It can be learned. (laughs) Discipline (laughs) is important in sales, especially when you talk about outside sales. You know, before we started, we were talking about how much we both love outside sales because it can be very different and that it goes where the client takes you. Um, But to me, discipline is critical in the follow-up and making sure that you are doing all the things along the way that will ensure that when you get to the close, you've got the information you need to close. So to me, it's very important. Absolutely. Well, let's dig into that. What, What are some things that you could not be disciplined about that uh, that would could leave a sales rep finding themselves at the end of the sales process and not able to close. Uh, you know, qualification comes to mind. What 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 are what exactly are you thinking about? Um, questioning, not just qualification, but asking the questions that get to really why is this important? How is it going to impact their business? There's the qualification of do you need it and why do you need it? But then there's drilling down deep to understand, well, how is this going to impact your business if you don't do it? So that when you get to the end of the sales process and they're saying, oh, you know, we're going to wait another three months or we're not sure we need to do it or we're going to use somebody inside to do it. You've got all the information that you gathered way back in the beginning when they told you why they couldn't do it or why they had to do it now, or how it was hurting their business, because you can give it right back to them. You're not left floundering. So the discipline of taking the time and going to the depth that you need is really important. Can I give you one other? Absolutely. The other one I think that is really important and people are more lax about is follow-up. Whether you're at the end of the process and you've given the proposal and you're just waiting around, which I think is the worst thing for somebody to call and tell you if you've won or you haven't, or when they say to you at the beginning of the process or even in the middle, you know, we're going to put that on hold, but we're going to come back to it next quarter. And then you never call them again. So to me, the follow-up is also very important. It's what keeps you from having to prospect all the time. And how do you recommend that a rep can have the discipline to not skip steps and rush through the sales process in a way that that leaves them with a suboptimal result? For us, when we're doing sales training, one of the top tools that we recommend is a call guide. If you have the discipline 
to plan what is it that I need out of this next call? Why is the prospect interested in talking with me? What are the questions I have to ask? What are the objections to anticipate? What's the next step? You know, I am planning that call each time you won't skip the steps because you'll be thinking about what is it that I need to know? The challenge right now is if you are in many of the organizations, the sales organizations right now that either have lost staff or they had to downsize due to COVID, you could be extremely busy. You might also be in one of the organizations where business is roaring back and there's just not enough time in the day. So you're not taking the time to step back and do that planning that will allow you to actually keep your, your process moving faster while still having the discipline to cover every single step of the sales process. And what do you think has changed uh, or is different in today's selling situations that reps find themselves in that they can make it easier for a rep to be off, caught off guard or, or cause them to lose, lose a sale? Right now, as we come out of the pandemic, suddenly people are coming back and reps have a combination of challenges. One is oops, we're going out in the field again. And instead, we've been doing business just like you and I are here, just talking on Zoom. Or the fact that they've got so many people who are interested and they've got a lot of opportunities in the pipeline, but they're not closing. And so one is a time constraint, right? Lots of opportunities, but they're not closing. The other is just remembering, wait a minute, we know how to sell face-to-face -face in person again and, and brushing up on those skills. And how can, a, what would you recommend a salesperson do if they encounter something that I think is, is much more common in, a, in, in tougher economies which is a, a lengthening of their sales cycle. What would you, what would you recommend to, to a, a team or a sales rep that's experiencing that, that lengthening of their sales cycles? Well, there are a few things. And you'll remember that I love lead generation. Hunting is my favorite thing to do. So I look at the lengthening of the sales process and in a lot of ways, if it's justified, that yes, it's going to go longer, your hunting skills come into play because you've got the same follow-up, you've got to keep their interest, you've got to have a good grabber to get them engaged in the conversation again, especially if they've said, oh, give us two months. And you gotta be able to get people back. Those are hunting skills. So using your hunting skills will help you to stay in front of those people who are genuinely lengthening their sales cycle. The other side of it is similar to what we were talking about just a little bit ago, and that is, did we ask the questions that help a client realize, no, you do need to make a decision right now. This is gonna help you. You are having a lot of problems, dare I use the word and phrase, in a lot of pain. There are issues that you're experiencing. Why would you want to wait? What's going to be different if you wait two months or four months? How are you going to get to that point? So pushing back, we've all gotten really nice during COVID because we felt we had to be nice because of how everybody was experiencing business. And it's not that you're not nice asking those questions, but we have to come back and start asking people, well, why, why do you wanna wait? How is that gonna help your business? How are you going to address these issues that you told me were real priorities between now and four months from now or six months from now? Are you sure you wanna do that? 
And what would you say to a rep that is experiencing tightening margins or maybe experiencing uh, smaller opportunities uh, during tough economic times? You know, I'm a master of small opportunities. Our clients that we work with are between a million and 85 million in annual revenue. And when we're working with clients who are at a million or two million, you know, those are small businesses that are trying to grow. So when you are experiencing smaller opportunities, it means you need more of them. The good news is with smaller opportunities and more of them, there's less risk. There's more work potentially because you've got to keep more opportunities in your pipeline. However, if you lose one, it's not as drastic as if you lose a whale and you only had two whales in your pipeline. <laughs> so. I don't personally think smaller opportunities is a bad thing. I think right now where we are coming out of it and we're still trying to gauge, well, what is our risk? Smaller opportunities can actually help you. And often they're easier to close because they are smaller opportunities. So you may find yourself closing more of them and still making your number. When I sold for IBM, and I don't talk about this a lot anymore, um, I had nine different industries that I was serving, and I had a $9 million quota, like that nine and nine, with an average sale of $30,000. So, wow, that's, that's, some high through, that's some high throughput. It takes a long time to get to 9 million at 30K at a time. Exactly. And I had, that was my average. So I had a bunch of them that were at 15 or 10. I didn't have any that were at 100,000 and nothing that was at that number. So it was a lot of opportunities. So just go after them and you'll find that you can close them faster and possibly you'll sell more to all of these people that are buying smaller too. They may buy two or three things from you. And what, what advice do you have for someone who is experiencing just a, a greater amount, a amount of pushback, more negotiations, maybe they're dealing with more aggressive procurement people um, in, in, in their sales cycles when they're, as they, as they go to close, they're just, they, they are getting greater, a greater need for, for more negotiation. Boy. That's happening a lot right now. And it's hard because if you don't have a lot of opportunities or you are staring at a big number, you really are inclined to want to give instead of hold off. Um, my recommendation is if you've done the questioning up front to identify why things are important to them, tie that information, get down to the ROI level where you can show the impact that the solution will have on their business based on what they have told you is important. Tie that to the proposal. And then when they come and they're asking you for negotiation points, you can point back to this is the ROI, this is what you said you would get. Um, and then it's holding firm, depending on what you're selling. Some of you, some of your listeners may be selling things where they can negotiate, um, but there are others where they don't have any negotiation power. So being able to tie to that ROI, as well as your differentiation point. So that when they start comparing you, say, to somebody else who's got a lower price, you are able to show this is where we're different. And you've shown it in your sales process, too, because a lot of salespeople won't tie back to the ROI or the impacts. So you're probably demonstrating yourself how different you are in value that you provide. What would you do for negotiations? What would your recommendation be? Um, yeah, and I, I, I think that's really what you've identified as one of the key things to that salespeople can do to be great negotiators. They can, 
you know, identify where the points of value are and, and identify what the ROI is, tie it to real dollar value. And then um, when, when it comes time to, when people are asking them for concessions, they can, they can point back to, to that value. I think that, uh, you know, focusing on the value is the, is the key to not giving up a ton of negotiations. And, and you've got to really understand your customer's businesses and be a great, um, a, a, an expert in, in, the air, in, in their business. You know more than they do sometimes uh, in tough economic times because you, you need to understand what the levers are and where to uncover the real, the real value. And, you know, we, we're seeing a lot of, we're seeing margins tighten these days, right? Like uh, a lot of companies are, are experiencing this tightening of margins. And, and so it's a part of the sales job reps job to, to defend those margins. Um, mm -hmm. You know, one, th one thing that I would recommend to from a sales management perspective is I'd recommend switching from, if you are experiencing tightening margins and you have been comping your reps on revenue as a sales manager, I'd recommend switching to comping them on profit margin. Um, because if you had like a, let's just say that you have 30% 30, 30 profit margins, right? Maybe you used to have 60% profit margins. Or so let's just say you have 30 now and, and then you, uh, your rep gives a 15% discount because they feel they need to to win the business right now. You actually need two deals for, for each one to, to get the same pro level of profit, right? Mm -hmm. If you were selling them at full price. And so it, at a time when you have fewer deals, you're, you're, you need twice as many, basically. So, yeah. whereas if you align the reps comp plan with, uh, with uh, margin instead of revenue, then, then it'll, you're, you're, their commissions are aligned with, with the company's goals, um, which is, you know, in, that, that's a, from sales theory is a good idea anyway, but, um, but you'll, you'll, they'll probably, you'll, by incentivizing them to defend the margin in that way, you'll probably get better results. But uh, they'll be but, yeah. less inclined to discount as well. That's yeah. They know it directly impacts their own commission. And I would say if you're getting a lot of pressure there, training your reps is important. Negotiation training, yeah. Specifically, it's worth doing a negotiation training, I would say. Absolutely. In these times, maybe more than, than ever. Mm -hmm. It's a because it is. It, it, there's, I think there's no hard set rules on how to be a, you know, a great negotiator. I, you know, I guess there's, there's a ton of training out there about it. I mean, the, uh, if, you, if, you, if you run a Google search on YouTube negotiation training, you'll get what, over 1.5 million videos, but most of them are junk. But uh, there I was are... Say, on this one, I think I would bring in a trainer an organization that specializes in negotiation. <laughs> yeah, it, it, especially because it's different for every company, right? Um, yep. And, and sometimes you can even have someone on the team. I guess step one would be figure out who on your team is great at it and and have them teach the others. But it really, because they, they know the business yeah. better than anybody. Yeah. Um, but I, I think uh, I, I think that this is really an area where, where expert, outside expertise can be, can be really helpful. Mm-hmm. Um, so what, what kinds of questions would you say a salesperson should ask themselves and reflect on if they feel like they're losing more sales than they used to, or if they'd like to lose fewer sales? I like when you can step back and do a win-loss analysis. So not just what do I need to do differently because I've lost, but also looking and saying, wow, what did I do really well that caused me to win? So I would look at both sides. Why have we won and why have we lost? Um, so stepping back and, and saying, what could I have done differently? Um, why did they tell us we lost? And usually they don't give the full answer. And then from there, looking to see, well, what else could I have done? Is there something I could have done earlier in the process 
Was it the references that I gave and they gave the wrong information? Um, you know, did I miss something? You know, one of my favorite questions to ask when I'm delivering a proposal is what, what's missing? You know, so that I can find out, gee, did our competitor suggest something I hadn't even thought of? Did our prospect have something in mind? So asking yourself all along the way, what are things that I could have done differently will help identify, as well as what do I think I did right for those that I want? And what about identifying where you are losing sales? Like, how do you identify, how, how do you approach your sales process or look at yourself and say, I think this is the area that I could use some more training. I should go watch some videos. I should talk to, talk to people on my team who are good at it. How, mm -hmm. how do you figure out where you're faltering? Is it, is it my opening game, my, my mid game, my my closing is—is is it am I just not qualifying well enough? Like, how what? How do you identify where something's gone sideways? Well, that is very scientific. So, looking at your pipeline and seeing where are the majority of my opportunities leaking out. You know, am I converting from a marketing qualified lead to a sales qualified lead? Am I getting from a sales qualified lead to the next appointment? When I get the appointment, when I'm identifying needs, am I getting to the next stage, depending on what your process is, it's a demo or more identify needs, you know, how far am I going and where are the opportunities leaking? And what you'll find is you're probably losing them at the same points. So looking at where you are losing them then gives you a clue to look at, okay, if I'm losing, when I get all the way to close, did I not get the right information? Did I not qualify? Did I not handle objections? You know, so looking specifically at that point in the process, if I can't convert from identifying needs to getting to the decision maker, because I now need to have a conversation there or to doing a demo, what did I not say that would make them want to take that next step? You know, did I rush? Did I not ask the right questions? Did I not demonstrate our value? So really it's looking at your pipeline. And if you're not doing forecasting, if your company doesn't require it because a lot of our clients are smaller, even though they're outside sales reps, they don't require forecasting. So then you have no data to figure out where am I losing? It's all got to be in your head. But if you got that data, go back and look at your pipeline and see where are they all falling out and then analyze it. And as you approach this type of pipeline analysis and, and, and I guess almost introspection on one's pipeline, if, if you wanted to drive results, would you say most reps or most organizations should focus more on where they're going wrong in the sales process or is it better and, and you know, kind of shore up the, where they're weak or is it better to look at what's going well and double down or some combination of the two? What, what are your thoughts there? Where, where do people find the most success when they're looking to make changes? It's a combination of the two. And for part of it, I would step back and look and see if you're feeling really beat down, if you've lost a lot, believe it or not, you want to focus on what's going right because you've got to get your own self-confidence and morale up again. And so you've got to see what are the things I'm doing that are making me very successful, then go and look and say, okay, Let's look at some of these that I've lost. And did I do those things that make me successful? Or did I forget them? Or did something else happen and I didn't have to do those things in the ones that made me successful, which might change who am I targeting? What am I selling? You know, so, so there's a lot of things that could come out of it. But I think you look at both. So self-confidence is low. Look at the positives. If your self-confidence is high and you really just want to do even better, then yes, you wanna look at what you're doing well, spend a lot of time on, well, why did I lose these? 
And sometimes you're glad you lost them. Sometimes they weren't the right ones and you should have qualified them and let them out sooner. Or maybe you let them out now. But look at what do I need to do better so that I could win an even higher percentage. Well, let's move on to the, uh, and, those are, and those are just fantastic insights. Let's move on to the next section, which is sales in 60 seconds, quick questions, quick answers. So in your opinion, what's the most important part of the entire sales process? Identify needs when you're asking just nonstop questions. And, and, and tell me a little more about that. What, what would you say goes into that? What are the key pieces of that? It is the qualification, the ROI questioning, the business situation, so that you can understand why are they even talking to you in the first place? How did they find you? Why would they want to go with you? Um, you know, what drew them to you? In addition to all the questions around their whole situation, who's impacted, how much is that impact costing them? So all of that questioning gives you the foundation, not just for figuring out what's my solution, but also who else do I need to talk to? Is there somebody else that needs to be on board? And then as we get later in the sales process, any objections that come up, you've got all the information you need from the very beginning when they were willingly, openly talking to you. Yeah, it makes a, a, a ton of sense. So, you know, a lot of people would say that, that listening is the most important part of sales, but Asking the right questions is is may may very well be the most important part. I guess I guess you have to listen to the answers. Have to That's say kind you of have the given. Listen to the <laughs> answers, and then you have to ask follow on questions based on the answers, so that you can funnel down deep and really uncover things that your prospect may not even have thought about themselves. What do you think the biggest place, the most important place is that sales reps lose sales? Follow up. To me, I see too many reps who give up too easily. They stop following up. Um, they send a proposal without ever reviewing it and say, let me know. They deliver a proposal and then let me know. And they don't follow up until they get an answer. In prospecting, they try twice and give up, or three times and give up. Um, following up on marketing qualified leads, they try a few times and give up. So following up and just giving up too easily. And, and what, what would you say the key to success in following up is? Is it persistence? Is it showing value? What, what would you say that, that most people's... Uh, where do most people stumble on following up? Doing it. So, I, I think it's the so the actual the, the actual persistence or the action. It's the action, and they stumble because they're not sure what to say. So in prospecting, we say you're going to reach out a minimum of nine to 11, 13 times right now until people get back to the office. And even as they get back to the office, if they've built old habits, they may not be responding. So you're gonna call, you're gonna do a LinkedIn message, you're going to email, you may send a calendar invitation, you're gonna do all sorts of things to try and reach them. Um, the challenge that reps encounter is they don't know what to say when they do that. So they don't know what to say in prospecting, they don't know what to say if they didn't get the next meeting, they don't know what to say after they've submitted the proposal that's going to compel someone to want to respond. So it's the combination of the act and then knowing what to say. And it's the knowing what to say is why I think they don't act. Yeah. And, and my best thought there is, is follow up with value. So whatever would be valuable to your, to your customer yeah. that you have, you know, in that it can have a lot to do with your exact sale or it could not. It could just be, you know, expertise on their business or an analysis or some, of, of something they'd find interesting. But, um, you know, the, it's also great if it's something that helps them make their evaluation or, you know, help, help, helps them run the ROI analysis, whatever it is. But 
follow up and follow, make sure you follow up persistently and with value. And, and the nice thing is you can kind of just have a list of, well, here's 10 things that are valuable and I can keep just, you know, on this cadence, reaching out to people with them. Yep. And if you're in the middle of the sales process and you're following up and they've gone dark on you, it's all those questions you ask. In prospecting, it's the whole list that you talked about. Uh, these are the different things I could talk to. And as you're following up, it's your whole demeanor. Friendly, you know, hey, we talked about this or boy, I had this interesting insight. I wanted to share it with you. It's just, it's the whole way you approach it. And if you get um, tight in how you're talking to people, then they're going to sense it and you're not going to be as interesting to talk to. Yeah. Why do you think salespeople who are losing sales should get back to the basics and expand their knowledge? I guess in another, in other words, why is it so important to train and do training in sales and invest in yourself? You know, oftentimes when you've been successful and then you're not successful now, it's because you have skipped steps. And so going back and doing training or reviewing what your process was, what's worked in the past helps remind you, oh, that's right. I'm supposed to ask those ROI questions or, oh, I'm not asking enough questions before I'm just jumping to the solution or whatever it might be. Just to refresh your memory of those steps that you've gotten lazy on and you're skipping. And what's your number one sales tip for a, a sales rep who's in a, a, a slump or maybe feeling discouraged? It's the same tip I would give someone who's been trying to do prospecting and they're not breaking through. Start by calling those clients that are really happy with you. And even if you don't have any clients, but your company does, calling and talking to some people about why they love your solutions, or if you know them, why do they like working with you? It will reinvigorate you because you'll hear, well, what is it that the company does really well? How has the company helped them? What do they like about working with you? And not only do you feel better, but now you have all that information top of mind so that when you start calling other people or moving about your normal day, you've got this whole different feeling in the pit of your stomach about, well, this is why people want to work with me. And as an actionable takeaway, what should the field salespeople who are listening today do as a first step towards restoring their win rate? First step you know, it, I'll give you a different answer on whichever day that you ask me. <laughs> and you and I have talked a few times. So um, stepping back and looking at why do you think you lost? You know, going back to what we were just saying about you know, talking to clients or looking and seeing my missing steps in the process. So step back and look and see, why do I think I lost? And being honest with yourself. And then just go back to your process and start again. Start doing those things that have made you successful in the past as a sales rep. Well, this has just been absolutely fantastic, Kendra. Where, where can our listeners read more about your work? What's the best way for them to reach out to you? Best way to reach out, I would say come to LinkedIn. Let's connect. Leave me a message and say you heard me here on the podcast with Steve. And to learn more about what we do, our website is klagroup.com. LinkedIn, you'll find me under Kendra Lee. Pretty simple, but do reach out. And if you have questions that I didn't answer or you want to explore something, just reach out. I'm happy to have a conversation. Well, I'm going to try to summarize what Kendra, you've told us today here. Um, so first, discipline is so important for salespeople to be successful. Don't skip steps in the sales process because skipping steps will catch up with you as you get closer to the close. So you can't skip those. 
especially things like qualification. Um, don't forget to follow up. That's a key one that people miss. Um, you know, people don't do it well either. You got to follow up with value and you have to follow up more than it feels like you have to. So follow up regularly and follow up with value. Salespeople need to adapt to changing times and you've got to connect what you sell to the problems that a prospect faces right now. And you need to connect to that ROI in these in your discovery questions, and that will help you later in the sales cycle. Um, especially when you're trying to negotiate things like price, if you've already done a bunch of discovery around how to connect your solution to their ROI, you're in a much better situation. Before each call, create a call guide, and that should include anything that you want to get out of the call. You want to include things like what you want the prospect to get or learn from you, what questions you really need to ask that you don't know the answers to yet, and think about what objections may come up and, and how you'll overcome those objections. If your sales cycle has lengthened during the slowdown in the economy, use your hunting skills to stay in front of prospects. Remember to ask the right questions that will get the prospects to act sooner. Questions like, what does this cost you every month that you don't make a decision? Don't be afraid of selling smaller opportunities. You know, a whole bunch of, uh, a whole bunch of sardines adds up to a salmon, I heard a wise man, man once say. Salespeople will, uh, will need more little opportunities to make their quota in a tougher economy. And there's sometimes less risk to having more small deals because you're just diversifying your portfolio, basically, just like investing. And, and those small deals can be easier to close. Demonstrate the ROI that you can provide for your prospects and connect it back to value. And that's a way you can differentiate yourself from the competition. Do a win-loss analysis after you win or lose to understand why you want to sale in certain instances and why you lost the sale in other instances. And, and really use those as an opportunity to learn on where you could get better or do better. Well, Kendra, thank you so much for coming on the show. This has been a great episode of the Outside Sales Talk. If anyone out there works in field sales, you'll love Badger Maps, the number one route planner that helps you get 20% more and drive 20% less. You can get a free trial at badgermapping.com today. If anyone can think of it, any other sales reps out there that would benefit from learning the skills that Kendra's given us here today, share the love and forward this uh, podcast on to them. Take care until next time, everybody.